eastern Greece. A battle rages that will alter the course of western civilization. On one side, the army of the Persian Empire, the most powerful fighting force in the world. On the other side, the army of Athens, half its size, led by the famed Greek general Miltiades. This is a battle of military brilliance in the face of overwhelming odds. A battle for the future of Greece and for the supremacy of the ancient world. Two civilizations are about to collide. East meets West on the plains of Marathon. Death comes swiftly. For six days, a brutal attack by a faceless invader stains the soil red. Those not butchered are enslaved. The aggressors are the heavy infantry of the mighty Persian Empire. They are called immortals. The victims are residents of the island of Euboea in the Greek city of Eritrea. 600 Persian warships had set sail on the Aegean Sea and swallowed every Greek island in their path. But Euboea is not their final destination. They're heading to Athens. The goal, total destruction. They move across, there's an island chain across the eastern Mediterranean in an island hopping campaign, much like the United States did during World War II in Japan, of capturing small islands, turning them into logistics bases, and, and, and then finally being in a position where you could attack Athens. Nothing stops the Persian war machine. From Eritrea, they set sail for Athens. The Persians eat cities the size of Athens for breakfast. They are so confident of success that they load up their ships with marble along the way so they can build a victory monument once they burn Athens to the ground. The Persian Empire is enormous. Its borders extend from the Indus River in India to the Nile River in Egypt. Persia was the greatest empire the world had ever known, not only in geographic terms, but in manpower terms, millions and millions of people. Also, one of the highest cultures that the world had known, and everything from architecture to art, to writing, uh, to design. And she was a multinational empire. There were more nationalities and religions in the Persian Empire than had ever existed in any empire before. By contrast, Athens is merely one in a loose collection of Greek city-states. What we now call modern Greece, you'd have to imagine at this time, was not really a nation, but comprised of a number of city-states, ranging all the way in the north from Macedonia down to Athens, Corinth, Sparta, all those states that, whose names pop up in history. Each city-state was a self-contained society, uh, had its own lands, its own army. But aboard his warship, the Persian commander Datis cares about only one of these city-states. Athens. He's so confident he'll be able to destroy this historic city. The only question in his mind is exactly how he'll destroy it. He can either attack Athens directly from the sea, uh, is one possibility. This is a bit difficult. Athens is walled, uh, and an amphibious assault from the sea against opposition is pretty iffy business. So he decides not to attack Athens head on, rather to pick a spot about 25 miles uh, away from the city along his line of route uh, and to land there and figure one of two things would happen. Either the Greek army responds and comes out to meet him, or he would land, assemble his army, and simply march on to Athens from the ground. So given the choice between the land campaign or an amphibious landing of Athens itself, he chooses the land campaign. Datis directs his fleet of 600 ships about 26 miles away from Athens at Marathon. He moors his ships in Marathon Bay and disembarks on the skinniest beach. The Persians then make camp on the northeast side of the plain, next to the Great Marsh. 
Persian army is about to slam into Athens like a Category 5 hurricane. The Athenians know surrender isn't an option, but they're divided on how to prepare. Should they hunker down behind the city walls or march out to meet the Persians in battle? Some in Athens believe that an open field battle against the Persians is suicide. But one Athenian disagrees. His name is Miltiades, and he has a personal history with the Persians. Miltiades is a very interesting character. Uh, he comes from a prominent family in Athens, and when he's about 35, he takes over a Greek colony in Ionia, on the edge of the Persian Empire. He rules there as a tyrant. This makes him uh, very unpopular in Athens. In the late 6th century BC, Miltiades' home on the Hellespont Peninsula is engulfed by the expanding Persian Empire. He's forced into military service. Now wielding a Persian sword, he must fight along his conquerors. The Persians soon spread north, cross the Danube River, and invade Scythia, modern-day Eastern Europe and Asia. Miltiades was in charge of guarding the bridges across the Danube over which the Persian army had come in order to uh, go into Scythia and prosecute the campaign. Finally, after three long years in Scythia, Miltiades decided he had enough. Miltiades had never been a big fan of the, of the Persians, and he tried to get other Greek generals to agree that what we ought to do is burn the bridges behind Darius and his army and let them die of starvation or be killed by the Scythians. Uh, now the Greeks would not go along with it, but it was Miltiades' idea, and it was picked up by Persian intelligence. So Persian intelligence were not very happy with Miltiades, as you might expect. Miltiades flees to Athens, but he's not welcome there either. The people of Athens still remember Miltiades as a tyrant and lock him up the first chance they get. Three years after his arrival in Athens, Miltiades faces the death sentence for tyranny. But he's got an ace in the hole. He knows the Persian game. And the Persians are on their way, looking to destroy Athens. The Athenians not only spare Miltiades' life, they make him a general. But Miltiades has to wonder which fate is worse, execution or being hacked to little bitty bits by the Persian warriors. Miltiades chooses to face the Persian blade, and rather than hide behind the walls of Athens, he wants to meet the Persians on the battlefield. But the final decision on whether to fight is not his to make. Athenian democracy extends to the army too. So when an argument erupts over what to do at Marathon, the council of ten generals must decide what to do. Attack now, or retreat and try to get help from other Greek city-states. The vote is five to five. The tie-breaking vote falls to a man named Callimachus. He is the polemarch. Uh, it's a ceremonial position in the Athenian army. Miltiades uh, makes an impassioned case to Callimachus, saying, it's up to you whether Athens is reduced to slavery or rises to become the greatest of all the Greek city-states. He explains that failure to fight now will shatter the democracy along factional lines and make them easy prey for the Persians. Callimachus is convinced, and he votes to attack. Miltiades gets his war. He leads the entire Athenian army, roughly 10,000 strong, 26 miles east to the plains of Marathon. The odds are overwhelmingly against Miltiades. The Persian force is colossal. More than twice the Athenian size. 20,000 infantry, 3,000 archers, 2,000 cavalry. Miltiades takes a look at the situation and realizes immediately he's severely outnumbered. He's not only outnumbered, he's outgunned in the sense that there are fairly substantial archer and, and uh, cavalry contingents. Even if the Athenians can hold back the Persian infantry, they have no way to counter the Persian war horses. It's a massive mismatch. Cavalry.
cavalry is one of the keys to Persian military success. They were one of the first armies to fully integrate horses and heavy infantry for a devastating one-two punch. And funnel their enemies into the chomping jaws of their main infantry lines. Miltiades is outnumbered and outgunned. The Athenians have never faced a force like this before. But they have cut their teeth on some of the greatest warriors of the ancient world. For centuries, these two Greek city-states shed each other's blood. But 50 years before Miltiades faces the Persians, a conflict erupts between the Greek neighbors that will ultimately lead to the Battle of Marathon. It's 540 BC, 50 years before the Battle of Marathon. Two Greek city-states, Athens and Sparta, attack each other on the open battlefield. The rivalry between Athens and Sparta is uh, kind of like Michigan versus Ohio State, except with spears. Uh, they constantly seek any advantage they can over one another. Uh, while most of their battles are, you know, provincial squabbles, uh, one of them gets the Persians involved and eventually leads to the Battle Marathon. Athens is known as the birthplace of democracy. Sparta, their neighbor to the west, couldn't be more different. Imagine that the U.S. Marines had their own country. That's Sparta. They train constantly, weapons, tactics, armor. It's pretty much all they do. Now, the Athenian-Spartan relationship is very bipolar. Sometimes they help each other, sometimes they fight. At the time, Athens is ruled by a man named Hippias. He is, however, wildly unpopular with the Athenian aristocrats. So they plot a coup and overthrow Hippias with the help of some unlikely allies, the Spartans. Now the problem with the Spartans helping you is that they wouldn't go home. And that was the problem that the Athenians had, was how to get rid of the Spartans. Well, they rose in revolt and drove the Spartans out of Athens. Uh, and this it was that period about 400, uh, 540 BC, which was the beginning of Athenian democracy at about this time. The problem was this. Inevitably, one would expect the, the Spartans to counterattack. Athens believes they need an ally to defend themselves against Sparta. They turn to the Persian Empire. So that's one of the first examples in Greek history of a smaller state trying to ally itself with a larger state, in this case the Persian Empire, in order to protect itself from aggression of another state, in this case Sparta. Athens sends an envoy to the Persian province of Ionia, now modern-day Turkey. At the court of the Persian governor, the envoy asks for Persia's help against Sparta. The Persian governor agrees, but on one condition. The Athenians must make a sacred offer of earth and water. The trouble is, the Athenians don't really understand what the offer of earth and water means. They think they're signing a treaty, just like the treaties they've made in the past with other Greek city-states. But to the Persians, accepting earth and water means they own Athens. It has become their colony. Without understanding what they're really doing, the envoys submit to Persian rule. All of Athens will pay dearly for this mistake. It made no sense to the rational Greeks. I mean, these are the people who invented logic, mathematics, and philosophy. For them, it was just a silly little ritual that really meant nothing. Now, the problem then is the same problem now. When you have two cultures reaching an agreement, sometimes that agreement means different things to each party because the cultural context in which it occurs is different. Athens secures the promise of Persian protection, but Sparta attacks so quickly, Athens has no time to call on her new ally. Determined to keep their new democracy, Athenians fight more ferociously than ever. They defeat the Spartan invasion on their own. Now this is important because Athens had asked the Persians for help, but they don't need it. They defeated Sparta all by themselves. The Athenians now felt that the agreement they had made with the, Spartan, uh, with the Persians uh, was null and void and made the terrible mistake of telling the Persians that. This infuriates the Persian emperor, Darius I. It amounted, from, in the Persian view, to little more than an open revolt, and Darius uh, resolved that he was going to bring Athens to heel.